Uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm assuming everyone can now uh, hear us and see us. Um, so welcome to the uh, November uh, technical talk of the Queensland ASCG. Uh, I'm James Alderman. Um, tonight, uh, Peter Fulliger from Fulliger Geophysics will be presenting um, the second part of a talk uh, he did at the start of the year in, in April. Um, before we start, I'll just run through a bit of housekeeping um, so everyone knows what they're doing and then we'll kick off. Um, so first of all, thanks to the ASCG corporate members and sponsors uh, listed there. And um, Peter, can you confirm that you're seeing the slides change with that? Yes, yeah, they're changing here. Okay, good. Um, thanks to the, the branch sponsors. Um, so that those are listed up there. I note that we, we don't really have any for, for Queensland. So um, if anybody uh, would like to get their name on that list, then um, please do, do get in contact. Um, so uh, this is the first time we've hosted, the Queensland ASCG have hosted a fully online um, virtual talk. Um, so we'll just, just bear with us. Um, as usual with, with Zoom talks or, or Teams talks, um, everyone will be on mute, but if you've got any questions during Peter's talk, then please uh, type them in the Q&A box or, or in, in the chat if, if you're having issues with that. Um, and at the end, uh, I can read out those talks if um, there's questions. If, if you'd like to ask a question, I can unmute your line. Just, just let me know in the chat as well. Um, uh, I assume that pretty much everyone on the on the call, it looks like that I can see is um, ASCG members. Um, if you've got any feedback or any quick queries about the ASCG, please get in contact with the, um, the, the branch presidents. I'd uh, be happy to take suggestions and, and, um, and, and chat to members. And, and keep in touch. So hopefully you would have seen this talk advertised through the, um, the LinkedIn uh, channel and others. Um, and if you're not getting emails and would like to get emails, then please get in touch as well. Um, I know a few people recently have had e email issues from ACG emails and also um, uh, if you want to change email that you're, you're getting, um, then we can help with that as well. Okay, so I will move on. Um, this is the last technical talk of, of the year that we've got planned at the moment. Um, for those in Queensland, um, a reminder that we've got our um, combined uh, Christmas drinks with a number of other societies coming up. Um, there is a deadline on here of the 15th of November, which is yesterday, but if you still haven't signed up then, um, and are having any issues and want to go, then get in touch and um, I should be able to help out with that as well. Uh, okay, so in April, um, Peter gave the first part of this talk um, on fast TM inversion using conductive ellipsoids, the forward modeling side. Um, tonight he's gonna to be talking about the the inversion side of things. Um, Peter, as I'm sure most people are aware, um, has, has over 30 years experience in base and pre precious metal exploration and petroleum exploration. Um, he's worked for 12 years. He did work for 12 years with WMC Exploration Division in Australia, including three years of chief, as chief geophysicist. He was the in inaugural chair of borehole geophysics at Ecole Polytechnique Montreal. Um, and served as team leader in 1995 to 96 for the EMEA P436 research projects on the application of geophysics to mine planning and operations. Um, Peter is an adjunct professor at the WH Bryan Mining Geology Research Centre at the University of Queensland. Um, so welcome, Peter. Uh, and I will stop sharing and pass over to you. Okay, thanks, James. I click share screen, do I? Yeah. Oh, good. Seems to be working. Oh, uh, yeah. Just need to go to that display settings again on your other screen and, and swap them around. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Looks good. All right. Thanks, James. Hello, everyone. Um, as James mentioned, uh, this is the second talk on this topic. Um, presented the first one on the forward modeling back in back in April. And tonight the focus will be on the uh, on the inversion. Just like to acknowledge assistance I've received firstly from Dennis Woods, who provided some uh, test data for me uh, for the inversions. Canadian royalties allowed me to discuss uh, in more detail the data from, or some data from the Expo deposit in Quebec. And in particular, Sirte, their senior geophysicist, has been very helpful providing geological background and technical input. And also, I'd like to acknowledge the assistance I received from Yves Amontaine. Uh, for verification of the forward modeling program uh, using results from one of his 3D programs. So the outline, firstly an introduction, which will include a brief overview of the uh, forward modeling routine, which I discussed back in April. Then go through the uh, inversion formulation that I've developed for the uh, conductive ellipsoids. Run through three fairly small, but I hope uh, indicative uh, inversion examples on some synthetic ground data and some uh, field data, some heli sand from the Athabasca Basin and uh, downhole TEM from that uh, Expo deposit, and finally conclusions. So, the motivation for this work was the pretty obvious uh, observation that not all geological conductors are, in fact, planar and plate like. And uh, although the uh, use of plate modeling is, is very popular and very effective in many situations when the idea is to come up with an interpretation of a particular anomaly and perhaps define a, a drill target, nevertheless, there are times when a, a access to a wider variety of shapes would, uh, would be beneficial. And triaxial ellipsoids uh, are attractive in that respect. Uh, they encompass uh, a wide range of shapes ranging from plate-like or vayner-like bodies through to elongate lenses through to more compact uh, pod-like bodies. Uh, and that has uh, sparked uh, the, uh, this, uh, this work I'm going to talk about today. Obviously, one of the attractions of the conductive plate modeling programs is that they are computationally efficient, they, they, they run quickly. And ellipsoids are attractive insofar as in their resistive and inductive limits, they can be treated as magnetized bodies. And that lends them to calculate their responses can be calculated using magnetostatic uh, algorithms. And uh, so that makes them attractive in terms of uh, computational speed as well. And for that reason, I've gone ahead and developed a magnetostatics based uh, modeling and inversion algorithm for conducted ellip uh, ellipsoids in the resistive and inductive limits. So this, this slide is just to reinforce the original point that all, uh, all bodies mineralization is not necessarily planar. I mean, these are, these are sections, so they're only 2D, but I think we can anticipate that in 3D, these objects are not going to be particularly planar uh, in geometry. And so this provides us with some uh, encouragement, if you needed it, to look at uh, a greater range of shapes. <clears throat> in, the in the inductive and resistive limits, uh, a spherical body has the nice property that it reduces or its response can be reduced to that from a magnetic dipole. And so this is the kind of trigger point for using magnetostatic algorithms to uh, compute the response of ellipsoids in those limits. I'll be talking quite a lot about uh, inductive and resistive limits. Um, the inductive limit is the response in the limit of very early time, or you can think of it as the response as the conductivity of a conductor approaches uh, an infinite value. Now, resistive limits, on the other hand, are defined as the complete time integral of the B-field response or alternatively, as you can see here, as the time integral of the, the BDT response weighted by time. And the, the resistive limit has some nice mathematical properties. Um, for a homogeneous conductor, it's proportional to the conductivity of the conductor. 
it tends to emphasize the late time response. I guess you can see that looking at the, the DBDT version of the integral, you can see that the, the values of the decay are weighted with time. So as later as time uh, increases, <clears throat> we get a heavier weighting on the late time values. And physically at late times, we have negligible interactions. And so to a fairly good approximation, we can add the responses from independent conductors. So it's, it's linear in that, in, that, uh, in that superposition sense. The other advantage from a numerical point of view is that by integrating the data in this way, we, we reduce our data from uh, multiple windows or decay, multiple uh, gates to a single number. And that has the advantage of reducing the size of the computation. But of course, there is a penalty in doing that. We lose the time evolution information available from the decay. So there's, a, there's certainly a penalty involved. But nonetheless, uh, the um, reduction to a single number is computationally advantageous. In real data, we, don't, we aren't able to integrate over all time. So we're obviously going to be integrating over some finite time range. And in the end, the user could control what channels, what windows are used, are incorporated in the, uh, in the integral, uh, what, uh, what range of data we can actually include in our uh, incomplete moments of inversion. So just a brief recap of the forward modeling routine. There's a solution published by Graham and West in their textbook for the case of a spherical body, a, a homogeneous sphere, so I've extended the formulation for triaxial ellipsoids. Uh, one of the properties of that solution, in fact, the spherical solution as well, is that the effective magnetization varies radially in the resistive limit, uh, whereas in the inductive limit, the effective magnetization is uniform across the body. So uh, on that uh, basis, I've gone ahead and developed an algorithm to compute both the resistive and inductive limits of ellipsoids. Uh, here we have a, a schematic showing the uh, current uh, in, in, a, in an ellipsoid at the resistive limit. So the, in the resistive limit, the current has penetrated through the entire body. And uh, we can see the, the ellipsoid, ellipsoidal or elliptical current paths there. And the main thing to take away from this slide is the functional dependence of the magnetization on the uh, radial coordinates. So as we move away from the center of the ellipsoid, the magnetization will fall away um, in, a, in a parabolic way. So we have a, a variation, a quadratic variation of the magnetization with distance radially in the center of the ellipsoid. And the magnetization, the effective magnetization is uniform in direction, but varies in amplitude uh, according to that uh, quadratic factor. In, in order to model that, I've combined a whole suite of uniformly magnetized ellipsoids in a kind of a Russian doll fashion. So by combining uh, a whole suite of ellipsoids with slightly different radii, uh, I can uh, simulate that uh, radial dependence of the magnetization within, within the ellipsoid and come up with a, a pretty decent approximation to the actual variable magnetization within the, within the conductive ellipsoid. And this is just an illustration of the uh, distribution of current. So as we move across the ellipsoid in the resistive limit, we have a linear vari variation of current. So it's maximum at the edge of the ellipsoid and varies linearly and changes polarity as you cross the ellipsoid. In the inductive limit, on the other hand, the current is confined just to the very uh, margin or the very outer boundary of the ellipsoid and is zero inside the, inside the body. So we basically we end up with spikes on the two boundaries and then zero current inside. So the properties of the inductive limit, uh, as I just said, the current itself is confined just to the surface of the ellipsoid. The internal B field is, is zero. And you can think of it as a, as a consequence of the conductive conductivity being effectively infinite. So at the very instant of uh, transmitter shutoff, or 
viewing uh, transmitter on time uh, in a perfectly conductive body, we're going to get uh, current produced only purely on the surface. The inductive limit is not affected by the conductivity. It's governed entirely by the shape, uh, size and orientation of the ellipsoid. Now uh, we do get a behavior very close to true um, inductive limit in highly conductive sulfide mineralization, in particular in nickel sulfides. Uh, and the, um, this is certainly one of the uh, original motivations for the development of the butane system, the on-time, uh, to, to measure the on-time response. Uh, and we can, can compute the inductive limit response exactly for a uniformly uh, magnetized, sorry, in a, in a uniform primary field. And then in time, the resistive limit currents evolve from the inductive limit current. So the inductive limit is the starting, the starting current, and then over time, the resistive limit current will evolve from that. Uh, diagrammatically, we can see the difference between inductive behavior and magnetostatic behavior. So in a magnetostatic situation, when we apply a magnetic field, the magnetization will tend to shift around away from the shortest dimension of the bodies. We'll get demagnetization across the body and no effect on the magnetization parallel to the long axis, the long dimension of the body. Whereas in induction, it's the, the opposite. The currents will tend to flow preferentially in, that, uh, in those longer dimensions. And so the magnetization, the effective magnetization will rotate uh, so that it's orthogonal to the longer dimensions of the ellipsoids. So moving on now to discussion of the inversion of conductive ellipsoid responses. The program, which I'm calling parametric, for want of a better name, uh, inverts the inductive limit or TEM moment, in other words, incomplete moment uh, data for one or more ellipsoids. The formulation is pretty conventional. I'll run, run through it pretty quickly. It uses singular value decomposition of the uh, coefficient matrix. The user can decide which bodies are going to actually be involved in the inversion and which parameters, which belong to those bodies, are going to actually change. And the user can also impose upper and lower uh, bounds or maximum and minimum values on the, on the active parameters. And the algorithm is fast. So the, magnetostatic algorithm is quick. And generally speaking, we only have a fairly small number of bodies and hence a fairly small number of parameters involved in inversion. So it is uh, suitably fast. Okay, I'm not going to go through this in any, any detail, but the aim of course is to solve for some parameter changes, which give us a better fit to our residual data. So the, here the O is the observed data, C is the calculated data, delta P represents changes in parameters, which improve the fit to our data. And D represents the derivative matrix or the sensitivity matrix, which relates how much, how much change we see in the data for a given change in a parameter. And almost always the problem is overdetermined. In other words, there are almost always more data than parameters. And that governs mathematically how you go and solve the problem. Um, I won't go into this in, in detail, as I say, there's nothing very new about it. Um, but just the important point here is that the parameters are scaled by a scaling matrix and the errors or the residual data are scaled by an error matrix. So we end up working with dimensionless parameters and dimensionless data. And then that's the formal solution using generalized inverses and ridge regression. Again, I'm not going to go through that in any detail right now, but the, the, the information is there if anybody wants to review it later and ask me questions, please, you're welcome. <clears throat> Just a couple of specific things about the, uh, the algorithm. For each ellipsoid, there are up to 10 uh, active parameters 
So obviously the conductivity, three coordinates to define the center position, three radii defining the shape of the body, and three angles to define its orientation. And as I said before, the user can decide which parameters are uh, active, which parameters are going to be allowed to change during the inversion, and also can impose bounds um, if, the, uh, if the aim is to keep certain parameters fixed, then uh, that, can be, that can be easily arranged. What I normally do is to break the inversion into, uh, into uh, what I call grouped inversions. I, I invert subsets of the parameters on their own. And I find that just avoids any problems with, with scaling. So I've not been altogether satisfied with scaling different dimensionally different parameters. So if you have a bunch of banks and you're also inverting at angles, we are here, it's sometimes not uh, terribly efficient to throw them all together and try to scale them. So I find it's often better to just invert with smaller groups of parameters that have common dimension, common physical dimensions, and also in this case, have common, an actual common uh, function in, in, in terms of the model. So anyway, one of the options is to run the grouped inversion. So first of all, to optimize the conductivity, then to optimize the position of the ellipsoid, then to optimize its shape, and finally to optimize its orientation. So to run those inversions uh, in, a, in a set uh, order, in a set sequence, and uh, proceed in that manner. But it is possible to run the inversions with all the parameters active if you, if you prefer. Um, this is just one option which, which I find quite convenient and usually quite effective. Now the only difference that, that those, those groupings were for resistive limit or for the T and moment data. The only difference for inductive limit data is that the conductivity is no longer involved. And so we've got nine, up to nine parameters uh, in, in shown uh, instead of 10. But the same group conversion can be applied. And then, then a couple of little nitty gritty things. Um, I found that it's, it's usually uh, a good idea not to begin with spherical bodies. The first reason for that is because they're completely insensitive to orientation. So the, the, the strike and plunge uh, and tilt angles uh, don't really have any effect on the, on the responses. And so that's, uh, it's generally better to, um, to start with bodies that are slightly eccentric. There's nothing to stop you running with a sphere if you want to. And of course I have done that and it, it, it does work fine sometimes, but other times it gets a bit uh, hung up because it has no sensitivity to, to those angles. And it's also pretty insensitive to the, to the radii as well, at least initially. So again, um, I tend to start with uh, ellipsoids that are slightly eccentric. They can be almost spherical, but just a little bit off. Perfectly spherical. Okay, so I've got three examples here. Uh, they're all pretty, well, two of them are, qu are quite small data sets. Uh, the the HeliSAM is a full survey data set, um, but I hope they give you some idea of the, what the program can do. Um, I've selected uh, ground data or illustrated inversion of ground data, HeliSAM, which in case you're not familiar with HeliSAM, it's a hybrid system with a, a, a loop on the ground with the data recorded uh, in a helicopter. And finally, some inversion of uh, downhole TEM. So this is some synthetic uh, inductive limit ground data. You can see the survey layout uh, on the left there. And it's a pretty simple case, just to give us a bit of a warm up. Single ellipsoid was used to create the data. Uh, inversion was unconstrained, and in fact, none of the inversions have been constrained um, in, today. None of the inversion training have been constrained. So no, no bounds were imposed. And uh, the misfit reduced from 88 to 1.5 in about 20 iterations of group conversion. 
So here's the, uh, on the left, showing the data, east, north, and vertical components of the inductive limit. And on the right-hand side, you can see a projection of the, the true ellipsoid and uh, the transmitter loop. And then these are, these are the profiles showing the observed and calculated data for the different components. So this is the east uh, observed and calculated. I don't know, don't know if you can see that some, some of the symbols are open, some of them are full dots. So the, the full dots are the observed and the open symbols are the calculated data. So we're getting very good fit for um, some of the lines and adequate fit on others there. So there's the north component for the uh, four different lines. And there's the vertical component. So it's done a pretty reasonable job. Um, it is synthetic data with no errors. So we'd expect it to do pretty well. We certainly want it to do pretty well. And this is a 3D view showing the true model in red, the starting ellipsoid in blue, and the inverted ellipsoid in green. So that the inversion has done a decent job of moving the uh, ellipsoid, the green ellipsoid, so it's coinciding reasonably well with the true ellipsoid. Evidently, the strike is not ex exceptionally well constrained, but um, in terms of data fit, it's, it's pretty decent. So I'm fairly happy that it's done a reasonable, a reasonable job. And then here we have a comparison between observed and calculated. And certainly qualitatively, it all looks pretty good. There's a bit of, uh, a, bit of a difference here in terms of the, the north component. But certainly qualitatively, we've got a pretty decent fit. So those differences we're seeing between the models um, obviously could be put down to, uh, to some extent, to one uniqueness. And of course, I could have pushed the inversion for a bit longer to try and get a slightly better fit. Nevertheless, I'm pretty happy with the fact that it's uh, giving us a decent reproduction of the uh, true data, the observed data. So moving on now to the second example. And this is a heli-SAM survey recorded in the Athabasca Basin in Canada. So on the left, we've got the topography and the survey layout showing the loop in red, the grand loop, and these are the, the flight lines which traced by the helicopter. And on the right-hand side, we have the uh, residual data set. And it's residual because a homogeneous uh, moment response has been subtracted. And I'll show you in a, in a minute exactly what, uh, what was subtracted from the original data to produce the residual data, which was then inverted with the parametric program. Now uh, here's, here's the, uh, the workflow. So the original data was converted to moments, integrating channels one to 10. So not all the data was included in the, in the integration. Uh, and then a couple of details there, the survey specs, so the line spacing is about 50 meters, the terrain clearance about 40 meters. The uh, B field data was measured with a total field magnetometer. So we're measuring the component parallel to the geomagnetic field. And as you can see, it's quite steep, the only combination of 78 degrees. The uh, homogeneous half space response was removed from the data, and I'll show you in the next slide uh, exactly what that was. So this is the response on the left from a homogeneous half space. And so this can have a distorting effect um, in depending on the conductivity and what uh, range of times you've used to create your moment data. It can have obviously an input bearing on the inversion. So it's uh, thoughtful to be able to remove that uh, response from the data prior to the inversion. Uh, in order to create a, a starting model, I ran a VPEN 3D compact inversion. So VPEN 3D is a, a, an approximate 3D inversion program, which also inverts 
DEM moment data, so approximate resistive limit data. And it was convenient to define the starting model this way. Of course, there's no reason that you have to do it this way. You can just define the starting model yourself using whichever method you, uh, you find most, most helpful. But it is, uh, was convenient to run the VPN 3D program to define a few conductive volumes, which were um, then used to locate three lipsoids um, for the starting model for the parametric inversion. It was just a convenient shortcut to uh, get to the starting model. Also, a little bit of geological information that the expected strike in the area was approximately north northwest and the dips were reasonably steep to the east. So I used that when defining the starting, uh, the starting model. So all the ellipsoids were oriented at um, minus 20, in other words, 340 degrees and the dipping at 50, 50 degrees to the, to the east. But during the inversion, there was no constraint imposed. They weren't forced to stay with that orientation. Chose ellipsoid radii of 190 and 80 meters. So you can see not, not spherical, or somewhat eccentric uh, for all the ellipsoids. And again, I didn't have any particular reason for choosing them all the same size. Um, I didn't have a lot of the geological information for this, this area. So that was pretty, pretty arbitrary starting uh, sizes. Um, as I mentioned, no constraints were imposed and the misfit was reduced from about 125 to 20, um, 25 iterations. So that's the host response which we've already talked about. And so here we have a comparison of the observed uh, residual data above and the calculated data below. And on the right hand side is the profile as shown towards the south, across the main anomaly in the south there. Uh, we have a comparison of the calculated uh, helisam in red and the observed in, in black on that, on that line. And then here we have another uh, profile through the northern part of the area uh, for a, a somewhat deeper anomaly. And again, a, a reasonable the data. So we've changed the color scheme here to, to highlight that uh, that northern anomaly. We're getting a much more intense view in the southern anomaly there. And then in in, uh, in plan and in 3D view, here are the three uh, bodies after inversion. Here they are in 3D view. And in this case, the bodies all became quite um, oblate. They became Quasi plate like, quasi planar, um, even though they started off reasonably uh, pod like or quasi spherical. Um, and the final radii you can see here so two of the bodies got quite a bit bigger. Um, but as you can see, the, the, the two radii or the two larger radii are quite similar about 160 meters or so, quite large bodies. Uh, and the third one, uh, again, grew, grew in size, but was smaller than the other two. But all three are fairly oblate, so fairly plain, which is interesting. Uh, the original striking and easterly dip was preserved in two of the bodies, and one, one and two, but it was different, it was not preserved in the third body. So that's what the uh, inversion Draw up for us. And again, I, I don't have any uh, real geological details for that previous Palisand inversion, but I do have some geological background for this third one, which is from the Expo deposit in far northern Quebec. And Expo is a nickel copper uh, platinum group deposit, and it's owned in that. And, uh, operated by Canadian royalties. So you can see the location here, right in the northern, uh, northern extremity of Quebec, close to the uh, Raglan area. You probably can't see the detail on the geological map here, but Raglan is just a little to the north of the, uh, of the exploder belt. 
So geologically, we have Proterozoics and the setting for the deposit is ultramafics, which have been intruded into basalts and metasediments. So the blue circle here is uh, highlighting the location of the Expo deposit. And then this is the a little bit more detail of the actual setting. We've got the ultramafic in this darker grey. And the mineralization is tending to form at, on the basal uh, edges where the, the ultramafic has, has eroded and the, the sulfitic melt has uh, moved generally to, to the bottom of those erosion channels uh, during the emplacement of the, of the ultramafic. And that's where we uh, generally get the massive sulfide mineralization. So this is again a pretty simple inversion of just one loop and one hole. And you can see on the right that we've got a combination of a somewhat longer wavelength off-hole response combined with a much sharper in-hole response. As a general comment, when I get uh, in-hole anomalies, I'm tempted to discard the data because it's generally quite difficult to get a good fit of data that's recorded in whole. And normally um, we've intersected the mineralization. We know perfectly well where it is. We don't need downhole TEM to tell us where it is. So there's generally not much loss involved in discarding the, the data that's um, through a, a mineralized intersection. In this case, because we've only got one hole and one profile, I wasn't going to start throwing it away. So the in-hole data has been preserved and uh, inverting the three component data using the Rubik's sort of modeling. So in this case, I used uh, moments based on the entire uh, decay, so over the entire uh, time, time range of uh, measurement for no particular reason. Um, so it's perfectly possible to select a range of times of a particular interest and it's pretty typical, for example, to use late times, as long as you're not into the noise, to, uh, to enhance the better conductors. Anyway, in this case, I used the entire data range. Again, I used um, BPN 3D to just expedite choice of starting models, so to define uh, conductive volumes of interest and then parked the starting ellipsoids centered on those lines. For no particular reason, I used uh, starting off-hole ellipsoid with um, major and intermediate radii of 40 meters and thickness of, of minor radius, radius of 20 meters. And first stage was to invert with just the off-hole ellipsoid. <clears throat> then I introduced a second ellipsoid which was intersected, so the an in hole ellipsoid. Its radii were 20, 20, and 10 initially. And it was centered on another seed cell from taken from the compact uh, inversion. And this, the second stage was to invert with just the second body active. So just the parameters from the second body were, were changing, plus the conductivity for the first one. So that was involved in. First body was involved to that extent. And then I finished off by allowing all parameters from both bodies to change. Uh, so in terms of the chi-squared misfit for the, in the first stage, it dropped from 2,800 or so to 1,200. And then in the second stage, or the second and third stage, if you like, it dropped from 1,200 to 600. So certainly the fit is not perfect, but Hopefully it's uh, interesting. And then here are the basic parameters for the uh, final bodies. Conductivity, the larger body was interpreted as uh, just over a thousand centimeter. There are the dimensions, so it's changed a bit from the 40, 40, uh, 20 initially. And the smaller body had a higher conductivity, 1700 or so centimeters per meter. And it, it shaped and changed very much. It started with 2020-10, and it was basically 2019-9. Uh, 
And on the right hand side, you can see the plan view of the two of the two bodies. Here are a couple of 3D views, uh, one from one looking east northeast on the left here. And you can see that the hole is just cutting through the edge of the upper body and just almost glancing the, the lower body. Uh, I could see better here at the intersection of the upper body, just clipping the very end of it. And here's the observed and calculated data. So we're not fitting the uh, in-hole response completely. It is having a bearing on this response, but it's, it's certainly not fitting it completely. And perhaps there's a, a, a case here for a third body to be introduced, and that's always possible, of course. There's no reason why not to have another body in there. This is the observed and calculated for the north component. And finally, the observed and calculated for the east component. So again, we're getting some sort of representation of the main elements of this response, but the fit is not perfect. And so again, we can decide to go back and put in another body and uh, and keep going. But it's a, it's a, I think I think it's a reasonable uh, a reasonable result there. And then here we have a couple of sections through the hole. So this is basically a north-south section on the left the model and on the right, uh, the geological section. Here we have the geology log in the hole itself. So we've got ultramafix uh, above and get going to uh, mafix below. Here's a zone of massive sulfides and at the time the hole was drilled, the Expo South uh, mineralization hadn't been discovered. So this, this uh, drilling and this uh, data had bearing back then on the uh, exploration for Expo South. But we can see that the large conductor certainly encompasses the location of that mineralization. And some minor mineralization, some minor lenses and some disseminated mineralization was also intersected in this zone. And so there's good reason to expect uh, some conductive response uh, in the vicinity of this ellipsoid here. So geologically, the, uh, the model makes pretty reasonable sense. So in conclusion, uh, ellipsoids are an attractive geometry because they emit a wide range of shapes from planar or plate-like bodies through to elongate rods, through to more pod-like bodies. And so they've given us, give us greater generality than, than is offered with uh, rectangular plates. I've developed a fast magnetostatic algorithm for modeling the inductive limit and resistive limit response of conductive ellipsoids. The resistive limit effective magnetization with uniform direction inside a conductive ellipsoid but its amplitude varies radially. And the resistive limit algorithm has been, conducted, has been validated using results from uh, Yvonne Matan. The inductive limit effective magnetization is uniform throughout the ellipsoid, uh, both in amplitude and direction. And the current is confined to the boundary of the, of the body. And in both inductive and resistive limits, the effective magnetization is rotated away from the major axes of the ellipsoid, which uh, is, distinguishes it from the effect of magnetostatic uh, demagnetization, which rotates the magnetization into the long axis. Uh, in terms of inversion, I've demonstrated the inversion here on some synthetic inductive limit data on a real uh, HeliSAM survey using moment data, and again using downhole moment data from the uh, Expo deposit. And the, the Expo inversion is the only one for which we have any uh, real geological background, and it's defined there two conductors, one off hole, which encompasses the massive sulfide section of the Expo South mineralization, and one in hole, which 
can be is associated with some minor sulfide vein mineralization intersected in the hole. The new algorithm can be employed uh, standalone, uh, like Maxwell, to uh, interpret individual anomalies, or it can be used in conjunction with other software. And here I, as I mentioned, used VPNG to expedite the uh, creation of starting models, so position the starting ellipsoids, uh, and, and also used it to remove the uh, homogeneous host response for that uh, heli sample. Uh, these inversions were all unconstrained. I did use some, I did, did impose some geological information on the starting model, but once the inversions were underway, there were no constraints. But uh, it is possible for the user to impose constraints if they wish on those parameters uh, by uh, restricting the parameters to maximum and minimum ranges between maximum and minimum values. And the final point is the starting, deciding on the number of starting bodies and uh, setting their parameters could be semi-automated. So thinking here of the, what, I, what I use VPN 3D to do in this case, and that could be of some value if you've got a large uh, airborne survey and you've got multiple targets of interest. It may be uh, helpful to uh, actually use something like VPN 3D to expedite uh, the definition of, of, of starting bodies, be they ellipsoids or, or plates, we don't know. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Well, th thank you very much, Peter. That was um, very, very interesting. It's good to see the um, the inversion side after after seeing the uh, the forward model side earlier in the year. Um, I've got uh, I've got lots and lots of questions, but I'll, I'll let others others go first. And um, I see Eric's typed in um, a question here, um, which I'll read out. But I'll I can also unmute. Eric, if you want to um, ask that question, rather than me read all of that out. Uh, hey there. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi, Eric. Good day, Peter. How are you? Good, thanks. Really good talk. Thanks very much. Oh, good. Very interesting. Um, shame we couldn't do it in person. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, we tried twice. Yeah, yeah I'll have to, have to come up and see you. <laughs> um, yeah, th there was well, two questions, maybe two and a half. But um, so fir first, I guess, um, so yeah, you use the VPEM 3D, and I and I and I um, see typically just a small number of iterations to get the basically to seed the um, the parametric um, inversion. Yeah. Um, how 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 would they actually compare? Um, you know, if, if I guess the VPM 3D were, were left to run to, to basically um to, to, to conclusion for want of a better word, are they are the responses comparable that you get? Uh, yeah, I've, I have run the VPM 3D, you know, for, for, to the kind of bitter end for um, the HeliSAM case, and so it fitted the data quite well. Um, I suppose I should go back a step and say one of the reasons for developing the conductive ellipsoid modeling is that VPM 3D has a limitation in terms of the way it actually uh, calculates the, the response from a, uh, a conductor. And, and the limitation is that it assigns the uh, dipole field in each cell to be exactly parallel to the primary field everywhere. And so it, if you have a, a, an elliptical body, for example, in, in VPEM 3D, unless you take special steps, which, which is another story, uh, it, it has no sense that, it, that it, a particular cell has no sense that it belongs to, a, to an ellipsoid. It's just responding on its own. Uh, whereas we know that if we do, in fact, uh, in, induce you know, current in an ellipsoid, then the response is affected by the shape and orientation of that body. And so that was another motivation for uh, running, or for, sorry, for writing the parametric program was to be able to go from a VPN 3D result and say, okay, we're interested in this um, conductive volume here. 
but can we now run a, a somewhat more rigorous, or nonetheless still fast, a program to give us a, a, a bit more uh, uh, better understanding of how the shape of the body uh, may be affecting the response. So it's, it was intended, to, if you like, to work in concert with VPEN3D to go from the original identification of a conductive volume through to modeling that's a bit more rigorous for, for the response of that conductive body. Okay, no, perfect. Um... Makes sense. Um, and the second part of the question is probably just a bit of fun because I like the analogy, but um, you know, the, the Russian the Russian doll, I guess, that you described, or the, the, the layers of the onion, I think it was um, early on. Um, I think you mentioned that, that um, I think you, you said that typically there are about a hundred layers or so used for that. Now, in the inversion, does the user control that at all? Is that something that's determined in the, in the background? Uh, at, the, at the moment, it's hardwired into the program, mm -hmm. but that could be changed if somebody really wanted to be able to uh, modify it, then that would be possible to change it. Probably, normally, the only reason you'd, you'd want to change it is if you were interested in modelling inside, inside an ellipsoid. Um, because when you externally, the, the, the detail, it's not particularly sensitive to the detail. Once you've got a you know a reasonable approximation for that um, vari variation in the magnetization, then externally it's not very sensitive. But obviously internally, it is important if you're trying to model fairly uh, fairly exactly the response inside of a uniform lip solid. Then yes, you would want to have um, you might want to have a more detailed representation of the magnetization. Okay, so so does does that affect the speed very much? Then or would it affect affect the speed if you know, I mean, one hundred versus ten layers, or, or to that to that effect, or not not very much. No. You know, I suppose I, I haven't run the program on really large examples with say you know, dozens of ellipsoids and, mm. and many thousands of data, but even on the heli sand example there, which is a decent sized data set, but admittedly only three with only three ellipsoids. It still ran very fast, um, so I haven't really had any reason at this stage to, you know, have any concerns about speed um, when I've increased the number of, uh, just like Russian dolls or onions, as, onion layers as you describe them, and I have increased it up to three hundred and, and not noticed any difference in the small examples I've run. So I don't think it's a big concern. Okay. Well, thanks, Peter. I'll let someone else ask some questions. I might have some more. <laughs> thanks, Eric. Um, so I haven't seen any other others typed in. Um, Peter, question for me: the um, the the homogeneous half space um, subtraction. Um, if you have conductive cover or or a, a, a conductive cover that you have some control over and that you know roughly how thick it is and, and, a, and a rough conductivity. Um, would you um, integrate over the full time and then try and incorporate that into a subtraction after calculating the moments? Or would you try and um, only integrate over later times to try and pull out the, the anomaly of interest? Yeah, normally you would just integrate over later times. Um, because you know that the shallow regolith is not, not of interest in here for that particular situation. And so it's usually preferable to restrict your attention to the later times. But you may still want to subtract off um, a host response. Um, it, it just depends on the circumstances, of course. You may still have a host effect, mm -hmm. even if you're looking at just the late data. Yeah. There is a, a um, it's possible to take the uh, time integration, the, the time range of integration into account when you compute that host response as well. So it can be a host response related to the actual time range you've used for the moments. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we've been talking a bit about that recently as well. So um, yeah, that's, uh, sounds interesting. And um, I guess, uh, 
again, in, in the absence of other questions, um, how do people look to get hold of this or use this um, moving forward? What are your, what are your plans for the um, inversion supply? Yeah, well, at the moment it's uh, <laughs> it's got one user, but um, I guess my longer term plan would be to incorporate it as a another a tool available through VP View. That'd be what I would do. But obviously, I'm open to other suggestions. Uh, so, if you've got ideas as to how you would want to access it, then let's talk. Okay, good. And we we do have another question from from Neil Godber come through. Um, so and I'm not sure if you can see it, but but how sensitive um, is the model when you're grouping? So um, in terms of the sequencing, and, and if you weren't using VPM 3D to seed the starting model, how much, um, how, how difficult would it be to get convergence um, and, uh, and also changing the sequencing? Uh, yeah, and I might unmute Neil just to maybe check that that, that was the question. Okay. Was that, was that okay? Should I answer or are you waiting for Neil? No, uh, you, you, uh, I'll let you answer. Okay. I haven't done any uh, serious investigation of how their sequencing affects the results. I mean, that's something that, um, you know, I could do or people could do on their own if they had access to it, just running different, uh, running the grouped inversion in a different sequence. I haven't, haven't really looked into that at all. Um, and then as for the defining of the starting model, I guess that's, that's uh, a task that anybody who is going to do this kind of modeling has to tackle in some way. So whether you're using Maxwell or multi-loop or just program parametric, you need to find a way to define the starting model and, and enter the, uh, the initial parameters. Um, and so, for these, for these inversions I've shown you, I found the VPAM 3D to be a convenient shortcut to identify the most important conductive volumes very quickly. Um, but otherwise people would just be doing it in the way that they normally do. Um, and I'm not really privy <laughs> to what people do. Okay, and um, we did have a question about part one of, of the talk, obviously for those people that um, weren't there to watch it, we did, it was our first attempt um, to try and record it and it wasn't very successful earlier in the, um, in the year. Yeah. Um, can I assume that if, if people are interested in the first part, they can get in touch with you to get the, um, the, uh, the abstract and, and so on? Yeah, well, I'm happy to circulate the PowerPoints too, for either talk. So if anybody would like the PowerPoints, then we can certainly organize that. Okay, and uh, uh, Eric has got another question, I think. I think you can just unmute yourself, Eric, if you, uh, you want to ask another question. Yeah, sure. No, I just thought I'd raise my hand before I talk over the top of someone. Um, but um, I, I, I guess it probably links back to my my first question, Peter, but um, so yeah, with with um, with VPM 3D um, being, I guess, a convenient way to to find um, or to see the, this parametric inversion, um, I suppose you could you could similarly use the um, go down the path of VPM 1D to to find a an initial solution, I guess, to to see to see this. Is that is that correct? You can do, but you need to be a bit careful with the depth because in one D inversion, if you have a compact conductor, then it's very typical for the depth to be exaggerated, and the same issue arises with CDIs mm. because they're based on essentially on a one D assumption. Um, the, the actual depth that's assigned is typically quite quite a bit deeper than the uh, actual target. So you could locate, certainly in terms of plan, looking at in plan, yeah, sure, you could locate the mm. um, target, but um, you need to be careful with the depth. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So I guess the inversion would have to work a little bit harder maybe to, to, to shift that ellipsoid yeah. around then if you're seeding it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Peter. 
Okay, we're, we're almost on time. Um, I think Neil got disconnected. So um, Neil, I'll let you talk again. And if, is there anything else you wanted to add to your question? All good. Okay. Um, the, the other uh, question was, how can we get a copy of the recording? So um, this, this talk is recorded and um, it will be available on the ASCG um, YouTube channel uh, in the next few days once um, the uh, guys have had a chance to clip it and uh, just, just check it. Um, that will be on there. Um, I think the ASCG is looking in future as to whether um, talks will be for members only. Um, and I think more communication will come out of that around that at some stage. But for now, all of the recorded talks will be on the, the ASCG YouTube channel. Um, okay, well, we're, we're right on time. Um, so again, um, thank, thank you, Peter. Um, uh, I didn't say earlier, but apologies to those people that did sign up for the in-person event. We had um, a last minute cancellation with, um, with Forex. Unfortunately, I think there's issues getting staff at the moment. Um, so they, they uh, couldn't do that, but um, hopefully that won't happen again and we'll be in person for, for next time. Um, look forward to seeing some people, um, if you can make it to the Christmas event. Um, and otherwise, uh, yeah, we'll, um, we'll see everyone soon. And thanks, thanks for watching. Peter, is there anything else you wanna add? No, just thanks. Thanks for everyone for uh, coming along. Yeah, we had about 20 people join today, so it's oh, good. And can you give me a list of the people? Yes, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. We'll leave it there. Yeah, cheerio now.